I want you to start by looking at this map. It's really an art project. It's a map of an imagined Africa. It's called Al Kabulan by the artist Nikolai Jesper Sion. He did this to basically try to think about how imperialism affected Africa. Or really, what would Africa look like if the European powers had never colonized the continent? Now, there's going to be a few things that we're going to talk about in this lecture, but kind of like when we started the New World discussion, we talked about kind of components of civilization. I want to talk about some key concepts of colonialism that apply to Africa, but honestly, India and Asia as well. And this is from Boston University. So colonialism in Africa is a new stage of relationships between Europeans and Africans. This isn't a continuation but it's a new stage. The conquest of these nations was done by force, by trickery, or sometimes, quote, agreements. So kind of like we saw the Treaty of Nanjing, there was officially a treaty, but it was shoved down people's throats. Uh, it's going to be kind of the same thing in Africa. The colonization and imperialism was a pretty short period, mostly from the 1870s into the 1960s, but it had a very heavy, lasting impact in both creating economic dependency and setting authoritarian rule into place. There was always resistance to colonization. In fact, there's kind of a cycle. Colonialism, resistance to independence. Each one of these nations got their independence, eventually. Racism feeds into colonialism. There's something called scientific racism and social Darwinism. You might have heard of that, kind of the idea of Darwinism, Darwin evolution, survival of the fittest. Now, people would apply that to a human scale, saying, oh, the, the certain people of the world are the best for ruling. They have the aptitude for it, and it's based exclusively on race. Scientific racism in the United States was often tied up in justifying slavery and the justification of colonialism was very similar. And I'm going to add this in. Colonialism represents a marriage of capitalism and nationalism. Corporations are often acting on behalf of the state, and the state is often acting on behalf of corporations. So see how each of these principles kind of plays out as we go through this section of colonialism. Let's start our discussion with what was sort of a minor kingdom at first. We're going to start in southern Africa. We'll start our discussion in what was sort of a minor kingdom at first, but expanded and then took on the colonizing British and Dutch in what is now the country of South Africa. And we're going to start with this guy, Shaka. Shaka's Zulu kingdom, at its peak, stretched about 11,000 square miles and grew to include about 250,000 people. It started out much smaller, but after he conquered other provincial kings, he was able to take more land by the time of his death in 1828, which came at the hands of his half-brothers. Now, the brother who emerged victorious would be the one to lead his men into battle against Europeans. So if we go back to the Portuguese exploration of the African coast, they were the first to round what they called the Cape of Good Hope and claimed the coast, but they couldn't maintain it. The Dutch took it over in 1652 and established what they called the Cape Colony. When the Dutch took control, they started immigrating there because there was so much money to be made in trading. As the Dutch occupied more and more land, several generations in, they began to refer to themselves as Afrikaners or Africans. Yeah, I know. They're also called the Boers, B-O-E-R-S. The Dutch implemented private property because they claimed that the Africans raising things communally and holding land in common, they weren't using the land properly. In 1815, the British took over the Cape Colony after the Napoleonic Wars, and the Dutch hightailed it out of there. Why? Because in 1807, Britain had outlawed the slave trade, and when the British outlawed slavery altogether, the Boers made the 1836 Great Trek to the Northeast to establish two new colonies the Orange Free State, and the Transvaal. 
Now that was all well and good by the British until the Boers discovered diamonds in 1867 in the Orange Free State. Great Britain annexed the diamond area in 1871, which further angered the Boers. But now that they were in the interior, the British started coming into contact with the native Xhosa and the Zulu, who by this time were the most powerful of the African people in the region. The Anglo-Zulu War featured one of the greatest defeats of the British at the Battle of Isandlwana. Basically, the British general took most of his troops to go find the Zulus and to crush them. And at the same time, the Zulus, armed with just spears, basically was able to kill 1,800 or so of the British soldiers who had been ordered to stay at camp. By the way, the British were the best armed military in the world at that point, but they couldn't match the numbers of the Zulu. The British got their revenge on the Zulu in a later conflict, thus ending the Zulu power. Their lands were given then to white ranchers. The discovery of gold in the Transvaal, one of the Boer territories, created a gold rush in the Transvaal, and soon enough, the British outnumbered the Boers. At this point, we need to introduce this guy named Cecil Rhodes. Have you heard of the Rhodes Scholarship? This is him. Uh, Cecil Rhodes went into Southern Africa for health reasons and became one of the richest and most powerful men in the entire continent. His trade was in the diamond business. He founded what became De Beers Diamonds, the people who came up with the diamonds are forever. He was also a politician, and for a time, he was the prime minister of the Cape Colony. Well, Cecil Rhodes had a big idea for the continent. He wanted a telegraph line and a railroad to connect Cape Colony to Cairo, south to north. That's a distance of about 6,200 miles by car today. Anyway, the only thing he sees standing in the way of that goal is if the Dutch join together with the Germans and cut off British claims on the continent. So he signs deals with a number of African groups, and in 1884 to 1889, united a bunch of different lands into a new country called Rhodesia. He named it for himself. Today, Rhodesia is Zimbabwe and Zambia. The inflow of English-speaking whites into the gold and diamond mining areas and British attempts to annex the two Boer republics, the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, led to the Boer War, which lasted from 1899 to 1902. At first, the Boers were winning, but an influx of 450,000 British troops turned the tide and crushed the Boers. Even though the Boers lost the war to the British, they ultimately won governance. The British essentially took the Boer lands, but let the Boers retain political leadership, which they were able to do through disfranchisement and maintained control through the apartheid system. Even though a majority of the population were indigenous inhabitants, actual Africans, not Afrikaners, the Boers held the power and denied power and rights to the majority. South Africa was a land of oppression. Let's move up the continent for the next part of the lecture.